First of all, on behalf of uh, Wawasan Open University, WOU, and in particular, JAWS, uh, Georgetown Institute for Open and Advanced Studies, headed, well, initiated, headed by Tan Sri Andrew Shen. Where, he, where is he? Okay, he is coming in because we are having lunch together. All right. Yeah. All right. Here he is. Yes. All right. Now, actually, he already uh, marked his place with his backpack. Okay. Now, um, today's uh, session, this afternoon's session, is going to be on the role of universities. All right. And um, we are going to post some very important questions uh, that after the pandemic, uh, a lot of things have changed. And uh, has university changed? And will university change? Uh, so these are the issues that uh, we have to address. And, uh, but before I introduce the main speaker, who is the author, uh, editor, editor, together with a joint editor, um, I will say just a few words right, um, about JAWS, uh, as you all know. Uh, you are, I don't have to introduce a bit more about uh, JAWS, and uh, this is the first, our first public forum in person or physical version after the pandemic. Yeah? And um, so what better topic to talk about the role of the universities and including the role of think tanks like JAWS. Now, since the pandemic, a lot of things have changed. The economy, the society uh, have gone online. Uh, there's a lot of interactions online, but perhaps less so person to person. We don't know, right? But businesses and life are undergoing tremendous digital transformation, right? Now, how should university then position itself in this? Now, before I proceed, let me have share with you a personal reflection. Uh, just over 50 years ago, when I started my graduate studies at the Comparative Education Center at the University of Chicago, I learned about how to classify uh, things that people learn, either formally through the schools or universities, or non-formally through the family, the economy and the society. And at that time, it was very simple. There's three categories. One, knowledge, right? Imparting and learning knowledge and applying knowledge. Second category, skills. Knowledge is different from skills. Skills, you know, you have to handle or you have to, you know, it can be communication skill, it can be whatever, right? It's not just knowledge. And finally, Attitude, values. So it's the so-called KSA, which we have been using for many years since then and refining and upgrading, etc. So now, the, another coincidence 50 years ago saw the advent of the electronics industry when companies like Intel yeah, and the AMD move offshore and guess to where? To Penang. It was in 1972 that they started the operations in Penang and that's why last year uh, there's the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Penang's industrialization but more correctly is export-oriented industrialization because before that we had import substitution industrialization. Right? So that was 50 years ago, but in the course of the 50 years, there has been a lot of changes driven by the semiconductor industry, yeah? the so-called uh, Moore's Law, right? and beyond, now it's beyond Moore, right? and how you know, the advances in technology have actually changed our lives economically, socially, even politically. Huh? And so these two major events or two, two major items in my mind 
you know, posed to me a question that with the convergence of 50 years of knowledge about pedagogy, about teaching, learning, right, which is also being disrupted by digital transformation and the 50 years of electronics industry, which is unprecedented in human history, that in 50 years, we have made so much advancement and so much changes has occurred, all right? So the question is, what, where are we now? And I'm sure most of you are aware that exactly a week ago, uh, this I'm talking about for, for laymen like me, yeah, an article in the Financial Times talk about the chatbot, okay? The a chat GTP, Generative Pre-trained Transformer. Yeah, this is the AI. Ability with the ability to write essays and to be able to come up with all kinds of things, whatever you want, all right? And um, then it has become a real concern for education institutions. But I want to say that this is also nothing new because when I was studying, there was a company called Thesis Unlimited, okay? Where you can actually pay and somebody will write a thesis for you, but not by AI, okay? by some individual somewhere, and I'm sure he will do a lot of work, but not as efficiently as AI, right? Well, his thesis unlimited. I remember that, you know, look at it, you know, unlimited. So the question is, how are we going to handle now with AI keep, you know, keep improving and increasing its power? And are we sure that we are going to be in control, right? But that same article actually ended with a response because the writer actually asked Chat GTP, GPT, what is the future? Are you going to threaten the universities? And Chat GTP replied, and I have to quote, it claimed that it is unlikely to kill the MBA program. Okay. Rafik, welcome. Okay. Um, so it ended with the assurance that it was unlikely to kill the MBA program because this is an experiment by the University of, of Philadelphia's Wharton School, one of the top in the world. Uh, where um, AI was asked to take examination in, in, a, in a course. And, hmm? oh, you see, oh, yes, it has, got, it has got a lot of prominent uh, graduates, okay, including some from Malaysia, okay? Now, um, this, the AI actually scored a B, B minus. That means above average for Walton students who are already the top, right? Very selective school. Huh? So the, the AI gives us this answer. Quote, while AI and machine learning can automate certain tasks and make them more efficient, they do not yet have the ability to fully replicate the complex decision-making and critical thinking skills that are developed through MBA programs. Okay, then it added, additionally, MBA programs provide networking opportunities and access to industry professionals that cannot be replicated by technology. Now, do you find this response comforting? So let us find out more from the experts who are gathered here today. Okay, So let's start with the, uh, uh, the editor of the book. And I want to introduce him briefly. Because I, oh, my memory is not so good. I have to write down notes. Okay. A physicist by training. Yan, 
first worked in the nuclear industry and with the Dutch embassy. Then he got involved in developing cooperative industry university research programs and founded a private firm dedicated to mobilizing innovative capabilities of companies, consortia, and regions. With such unique experiences, together with several other prominent people, some of whom were Nobel laureates, he initiated Institute Paralimus, correct? Then he, I think I'll let him explain what Paralimus, it, it actually means, you know, without, beyond boundaries, you know, above boundaries, beyond boundaries, but why para, why limus? Okay, he will explain. I think he'll let you explain much better. I ask, right? It's for the exploration of ideas and the implementation of initiatives not to be limited by discipline, methodology, institution, or generation. Now, this is also not something very new because we have been talking about multidisciplinary studies and all that, and my comparative education center was such because we use economics, sociology, philosophy, blah, 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 to study education and society, education and economy, right? But this is different in the sense that you are going beyond and you are aided by digital transformation with a lot of information and also probably aided by AI. So AI will not replace an editor, I hope. Then he became the director in uh, 2011 of the complexity program of the NTU, Na Nanyang uh, Technological University in Singapore. And uh, since four years ago, he has been back in your home country of Netherlands and restarted Paralimus in Europe. By the way, he is a member of JOR's International Advisory Council. So after the launch, we'll invite four panelists uh, to talk about this topic and then to be concluded by a special guest. Okay, I will introduce them later on. So to you, Jan. What can I add after such a wonderful introduction, actually? <laughs> the, um, I'm not going to talk about the, uh, the, the, the digital transformation of universities. I'm going to talk about the book that was, uh, that's the book, that asked the question whether universities nowadays and as we look to the future are fit for the purpose that they were established for. Jonathan will talk a little bit about the digital part of it because he knows about it. I know very little about digital transformation and in a way I'm happy that I don't know too much about it. And I don't actually believe that the, the uh, big transformation that we're in is only part of the digital transformation. I think there's a lot more going on. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm not a gifted speaker, so I make notes that I, that I uh, read from. It's in the last uh, uh, half of the pre previous century, and even more so, in the past 20 years of this century, that the world seems to have changed into a um, mode of uh, accelerating change. That change has many drivers, like the growth of the world population, the increasing speed of the development of new technologies, the intensifying global connectivity, the unexpected consequences of collective human consumption and behavior, and not to mention the synergies between those drivers. The impact of those changes manifests itself in threats to human societies like climate change, a growing mass of microplastics in the ocean, pandemics, resource scarcity, inequality, and a variety of other problems that play out on a local, regional, and global level. Because the dynamics of these changing, uh, changes generate uncertainties, the connection between science, university, and society is losing the stable context within which it evolved in the last few hundred years. That context enabled the system of reduced reality to take hold of the Western world and through Western domination 
to infest a large part of the non-Western world with it. Reductionism was instrumental in this. It triggered the growth of mostly disciplinary scientific knowledge and a subsequent explosion of technological developments that, in the last century, has largely obfuscated the complex nature of the world, the non-disciplinary uh, nature of its problems, and the many different cultures that evolved in it. But the accelerating changes also laid bare the inherent tension between that reduced reality and the world that is characterized by the complexity of its systems. Among, among other things, the differences, the difference between the knowledge produced and taught in universities and the knowledge needed in a continuously evolving society has come to haunt us. Universities are part of society. Society as a whole evolves in unpredictable ways. If universities are to sustain, sustain themselves in their society, they must be able to exploit its local conditions sufficiently to survive and be able to explore the boundaries of their existence to cope with changing conditions. How to do this? How to recognize and understanding the changing conditions, how to carve out a path to the future that will make it possible to adapt to these conditions and exploit them in, sustain, in a sustainable way? What is the nature and the direction of changes that universities have to make in their relationship with society? What does that mean for education? What, uh, what kind of education, how and for who? And what does it mean for society, for science and for the dynamics of their relationships with research institutes, industry and others? What moral positions can or should universities claim? What, in other words, are conceivable futures for universities? What can those futures be, given the loads that universities carry with them from their different cultures and pasts? How should the connection and interaction between science, society, and the university develop? What structures will serve those, those connections best? What educational systems will develop? What does that mean for the structure of universities? Who guards the truth? And what is the role of universities in creating it? What does that mean for education, for edu intellectual property and its exploitations? And how is this different in different cultures? In December 2020, the future office of the National University of Singapore commissioned an essay for the future of universities. That essay addressed some of the questions raised above and left many unanswered. It also made clear that there is a need for a series of enlightening visions about possible futures of the university. To develop such visions, 12 leading thinkers from different continents, countries, and cultures were invited to write an essay presenting their views on the future of universities. All were free to present their visions from, the perspective, from, from their perspective and to address issues they think are most relevant for the future. All initially accepted the challenge, but subsequently and unfortunately, global politics and local circumstances created dangers for some to express themselves freely and made it impossible for them to actually write down those views, their views. So not all 12 people wrote an essay. There were only yet nine essays written, including the triggery essay, and they're collected in the book Fit for Purpose. They are connected by the sincere concern of the writers for the future of universities and by the authority that comes with the positions they hold or held in society and the experience they have accumulated in their lives. One chapter stands out. It is the chapter that presents the view of 18 students, students from all over the world. Together, they provide a unique insight in what young people who recently, only recently finished their university education or are still working in it, see as problems and needs for universities. Many of these students come from countries where it is dangerous to express themselves freely and openly. So for good reasons, they remain anonymous. 
The many similarities between the views expressed by the students and the writers of the other chapters, the other essays, in other words, are remarkable. They point to serious problems for universities worldwide, but also to a potentially powerful co coalition of young and old, experienced and unexperienced people around the globe to address these problems. The book Fit for Purpose was not conceived as a manifest for action. Yet the ten essays provide powerful material to inform, inspire, and crystallize discussions about the key issues that must be addressed if universities are to adapt to the changes in society, science, technological development, educational methods, and changes in the moral compasses steering society. The book starts with the essay that was commissioned by the NUS. Writing that essay was highly motivating and inspired the ideas to invite a broader specter of views for the future of universities. The first of the nine essays describes the history of university since its first inception, possibly 9,000 years ago. The writer, Sasha Zender, who is here, rightfully felt that the book about future university of universities should start with a shared story about its histories. His essay, How It All Began, provides an overview of these histories, covering the developments of universities in all continents and major con cultures in the world, both past and present, ending with a description of traits common to all universities. In the last 200 years of that history, the Humboldt University has become the dominant role, the dominant model for universities in the world. As Alexander Inouye Khan uh, argues in his essay, Humboldt Universities as a Role Model, um, its success is based on a combination of four ingredients. Education and research under one roof, academic community of scholars and students, a joint responsibility with public and private sectors for the university, and the principle of academic freedom and independence. The combination of these ingredients have been very successful and unquestionably has a future. But each of the ingredients are presently challenged. To secure the future of the universities, these challenges must be taken seriously. One may argue that these challenges to a large extent emerge from entangled global complex adaptive systems that are being subjected to disruptive trans uh, transitions, or better, that these disruptive transitions form the dynamic context within which future universities need to find a role. In his essay, The Role of Universities in Disruptive Transitions, Sean Cleary provides an historical background and context for the extraordinary times that we're in. We are now confronted with six interlocking challenges that demand our attention and response. They're all mentioned in the book, so I won't mention them here. When addressing these challenges, we need to recognize and take into account the key characteristics of the complex adaptive systems that we are part of. Then, looking at the future at the universities, Jean Cleary describes the implication of all that for their future role. As Alexander Inouye Khan wrote, the last 200 years have, been, have seen a rapid and glo global spread of the European model for universities as embodied in the Humboldt University. In his essay, Chinese Big Learning or Narrow Minds, Andrew Sheng points out that China was a latecomer in this game. Andrew offers an enlightening insight into the role of higher education uh, that higher edu education plays and has played in Chinese history. Projected against that history and more recent developments in Chinese, in China, Andrew asked whether the universities are presently configured, uh, whether universities as presently configured serves an elite, serves the society as a whole, or serves itself. A highly relevant question for universities in China and for university in what is generally regarded as the West. In addressing that question, universities are best to be thought of complex adaptive systems within a wider context of changing complex adaptive systems, nature, society, and the cosmos. 
the normal changes that those systems have gone through in the last decade, uh, de decennia, have postponed universities and the knowledge, technologies, and ethics they, ge they generate. So they have postponed universities in the center of the geopolitics. They have positioned universities in the center of geopolitical rivalry between the West and the rest. And in that context, again, Andrew asked the questions, which is the, so the source of the title of the book. Are uni universities now fit for purpose in the future? The 18 contributions of the students offer a mirror, mirror for the answer to that question. In his second essay, uh, Drivers for Solutions, Alexander Zender, Sasha, addresses the question how universities have dealt with the tasks that society has relatively recently bestowed on them, namely to contribute significantly to solutions for sustainable human well-being, civilization and security for all, through a forward-looking and proactive combination of education and cutting-edge research. Based on roughly 50 years of observation and, finding, uh, and findings while working in a variety of universities around the world, he analyzes global megatrends that will influence and challenge humanity, the strength of universities, the economic impact of universities, and the challenging challenges facing universities. Projected against the global megatrends, these challenges can be summarized as the need to bridge the widening gap between science, the public, and politi politics. This analysis concludes with an answer to the question what needs to be fixed in order for universities to be fit for the future. Future ready or ready for purpose. I will skip some of these chapters because actually it's an invitation to read the book and if I tell you what is in the book, chapters you won't read it so we i'll skip the two chapters but i'll go i'll come to an end there is uh, universities are they future ready and ready for the purpose in the uh, are they ready for purpose in the future in the end it are young people at the beginning of their productive lives who will transform the present into the future Universities can be said to be future ready or ready for purpose in the future if they can deliver students who are future ready. The 18 ex-students who express their views on the future of universities provide some key elements of what, is being, uh, what being future ready really should mean. Now I want, having said all this, I mean, that is, the book will expand on all that and it's I think it's worthwhile to read it. It was definitely worthwhile to edit it. So I'd like to invite or uh, introduce um, my co-editor, Jonathan, to give his perspective as my co as my co-editor. He is a young education, uh, a young educator from the National University of Singapore. He is now working with the NUS Teaching Academy to explore the impact of AI on higher education and to propose educational policies on how the university can embrace it in a way that will enable, will enable not just students for, to be future ready, but also for educators and academics to remain ready for purpose in the future. Jonathan. Thank you, Jan. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jonathan Sim. I'm a lecturer of philosophy at the National University of Singapore. Uh, I teach the philosophy of computing and data analysis. Uh, so we deal with the ethics of algorithms, the ethics of models, right? I also teach classical Chinese philosophy. So two very different things, but somehow it's all in from the one person, right? Um, now, sorry, can I just go? I, I want to comment, well, there are many, many learning points from, from this book, and it has been a real honor and privilege for me to be a co-editor, right? There, there's one lesson uh, out of many lessons that I wish to highlight from this book, which is, the success of universities in the past can also be the stumbling blocks for universities in the future. And when this book came out, um, it, it was published some, sometime in November, right? Uh, we didn't expect AI, chat GPT, to come out, right? And so it is very, very fitting that this book came out uh, around the same time as uh, the, the, the chatbot. Now, 
uh, it's very easy for us to talk about the future or the futures of universities in a very general and abstract way. But in many ways, I believe that the future is here. Uh, what, what do I mean? Because you see, uh, just a show of hands, how many of you have actually played with uh, ChatGPT? Okay, so for those of you who have not, okay, ChatGPT is one of many more artificial intelligence that we're going to uh, see, right? Um, it can write essays. I can take an MCQ multiple choice question. I can feed it in. It can answer. It can tell me which option is the correct option, okay? I can write, get it to generate programming code. I can even feed it buggy programming code and ask it to fix it for me, right? I can get it to write essays. I can get it to write plays. I can get it to write poems. Now, in Singapore, there are many people who are using it in industries now. They're writing emails with ChatGPT, right? Uh, they, some of the marketing texts are, are also being written uh, by ChatGPT. Uh, Ryan Reynolds did a car advertisement and he also used ChatGPT to do the, the text, right? So it's becoming more and more mainstream. And why is this a, a relevant question? You know, the future is here. It's because more and more students are going to go for internships. They're going to go into industries and they're going to see that the people at work are going to use AI, right? And they're going to say, why am I at university? Why am I paying all these school fees when all I just need to know is how to play with ChatGPT? As an educator, I realize I'm also at existential risk. Why? Because now if you go online, many students are saying, hey, ChatGPT can teach better than my teacher. And, they're more, and the AI is more patient, you know, right? If you don't understand, you can still say, I don't understand, and the AI can respond. And this is only version 3. Version 4 is coming out this, later this year, and there's going to be version 5, version 6, right? And, we can, uh, and, and, and one of the chief uh, AI scientists from UNSW has said that in the forthcoming versions, you can train it to speak in your own voice. Right now, if you play with ChatGPT for one hour, you're going to see that there's a very consistent writing style. Of course, you can say, oh, can you write it in the style of, uh, let's say, Dr. Mahathir? It can, it can do that, right? You can, uh, it, it can learn and it can write in the style of Lee Kuan Yew as well, right? So you, we can do that. But in the future, it can learn from us and write in our own style. What does this mean for us as educators? What does it mean for us at work, right? Now, so there is a huge existential risk Okay, and at the National University of Singapore, um, I, I am right now working to research ways for us to add value because, yeah, like I said, students are going to say, if I can do all these things with AI, I don't need to come to university. So then what is my value as an educator? What is our value as a university so that students will say, I still want to come, I still want to get my degree, yeah? And it's very, uh, of course, it's worrying. And, and one of the things that, that I want us to, to recognize is that, is that it's not just a cheating tool. Because one, one of the scary things is that when we frame it as a cheating tool, it becomes framed as this taboo subject. Don't talk about it. Let's not touch it. In Australia right now, right? Uh, if you've been following the news, Australia, New York, all the universities have stopped continuous assessments. They've gone to closed book final exams, Right. How drastic is that? Now, just think about it. We say, okay, all this AI is going to replace deep thinking, deep learning. But if we're so afraid of cheating that we go back to closed book final exams, then we're not giving students a chance to go further in their thinking, right? If we want students to think deeply, we can't give them two, three hours. We can't make them cram for a final exam, right? So, and one more thing also, it, this AI, uh, ChatGPT is one of many, right? It's going to be here to stay. The CEO of Microsoft already said, uh, Microsoft has uh, made a deal, right? It's going to be in the productivity tools. You're going to see ChatGPT in Microsoft Word, Microsoft Outlook, PowerPoint and everything, right? So it's going to be here to stay. So we as educators, we need to figure out how we can embrace artificial intelligence in our teaching so that students can see the added value. That is the key, right? And of course, like I said just now, the things that have made, <clears throat> the things that have made universities successful are also the stumbling blocks for how we engage with the future. Now, let me explore two possibilities with which uh, we can embrace AI, just so you know how big the revolution may be, right? The first is this, okay? We can get the AI to generate an essay, right? Um, by my standards, I would give it a B, very rarely a B plus, right? 
So there is still room for improvement, right? So we get the students to generate an essay and then we say, okay, we will grade you based on how you edit this essay. Maybe you turn on uh, track changes in Microsoft Word lah, so we can see the changes. Now, you notice that the learning objectives have changed. We are not teaching students how to write essays anymore. We're teaching them how to edit essays, right? So one way in which we embrace AI is that all, many, or in fact, most or all of our learning objectives were shift. And when these learning objectives shifts, what happens? All our learning activities will change. Uh, so what's the problem? How many educators are willing to embrace this kind of change? It's a lot of work. I mean, I design one course. I, I teach like five, 600 students every semester. I have weekly assignments. I've changed every assignment. How many uh, educators are willing to do that, right? So that's one. Now, Another way in which we can embrace AI is we say, okay, let's move away from grades. Because if, let's say, AI can do everything in the future, can do everything that we do very well in terms of content generation, okay, then maybe we need to play up other areas, like you know, building up their portfolio. Yeah? Uh, they may not be good at study, or they may be good at study, but we want them to be good at something else. Um, teamwork, leadership, and stuff like that, right? Again, what, what is the problem that we will face? Many educators are going to say, this is not my job scope. This is not my KPI. Why should I care? Right? So, I, and I already as a young educator, uh, sometimes I talk to people, I say, you know, I, be I believe education should be this. Some educators, right? Some faculty, uh, they, they will say, no, why are you doing this? This is not your job. Right? So we need to be, we do need to have this question. And of course, maybe to help frame our discussions of AI uh, is we, we tend to think of AI purely in terms of uh, like replacement because it's efficient, it's going to replace. But let me offer you two more categories. Rather than, than replacement, substitution, why not think of it as augmentation? How can AI augment us, assist us? Yeah? How can it add value to us just as how we can add value to the work that AI does? Another category for thinking about it is rather than in terms of efficiency, what about human flourishing? How can AI lead us towards greater human flourishing? If, for example, like say we, we learn to write better because of uh, using a, the AI as, say, as a base, right? It, th this kinds of exercises is pushing us to think further, think deeply, right? So maybe this is the thing that, 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 that we, should, we should consider. Yeah? Uh, augmentation rather than substitution, human flourishing rather than efficiency. Well, okay, that is all. Say, um, yeah, some food for thought. Thank you very much. Uh, no, I, I wanted to, to make some comments in response to, to uh, many of the remarks that were going around the room. Uh, because I, I wear two hats, right? I wear the hat of a philosopher. I wear the hat of an educator, right? Uh, and we hear the word ethics and uh, wisdom and humanity being thrown, thrown around uh, quite a lot in the past, uh, in the, uh, just now, right? So... Two observations about digital transformation, and uh, this is coming from me as an educator. I see one thousand uh, around one thousand students every year, right? And many of them in NUS are also from Malaysia. So what I see, I, I think we can extrapolate and say it applies here, right? Uh, we talk about mental mental health. Why are so many uh, of our students? Okay, maybe I stand because I'm. Why are so many of our students actually? Um, having so much anxiety and mental health problems. A lot of it actually has to do with social media, digital transformation, and we're not paying enough attention to it. Because I, I speak to my students and I ask, you know, we, when I was a student, we just say, I stress, I stress, I stress. Now, they use language of fear. They don't say I stress. They say, I'm afraid, I'm anxious, I'm worried, I'm scared. This is the language of our undergraduates now. And I ask, and I've been trying to find out why. And I, what I've come to realize is they've been growing up in, a, in an age of social media. Since they, 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 whenever they can remember, it has always been social media. But one thing that our young people don't understand is that when, when we post on social media, we post what? Our idealized versions of ourselves, right? Before, when we were students, you know, if I want to see how my peers are doing, I'll just like check in on you, right? Oh, okay, you're like, you're, you're like that, like that, right? Now, we rely on social media as if it's going to uh, inform us and everyone's just posting their idealized versions of themselves. So imagine, right? I'm a student here. On, I go on Instagram. Everyone's here. 
that's why the stress is incredibly high. Like every time I talk to one of my students, they join LinkedIn, right? And then they see, oh, my peers have uh, five internships. They are in two ex exco committees. They, they have uh, 10 online uh, course uh, certificates. They panic, they panic. And, and I have students writing to me. They say, uh, uh, Miss Mr. Sim, you know, I, I'm so tired. I just want to rest. But everyone is doing everything, you know. So now, link to digital transformation, right? We say that social media is impacting mental health. But look at what's going on in our, our public discourse. We are framing this as a technological problem. We're saying, oh, this is the problem of Instagram. The, de the developer should do something about it. We, we, every time a computer is involved, we keep framing it as a technological problem. We don't realize that nowadays, the, the online and offline world are overlapping. So we need to stop talking about it as a computer problem and more as a culture problem, right? Uh, and now with AI and with robotics, um, in the field of philosophy, right, we are starting to realize that a lot of philosophical, ethical questions are fast becoming engineering questions engineering questions right like if the car you know automated car so you know, you're just driving down so suddenly a pedestrian just jumps out right should the car prioritize saving the driver or saving the pedestrian there and there that's an engineering question already so many and and because we frame all these technological problems as computer problems as tech problems we are relying on the developers to make ethical de uh, decisions for us and many of them are not trained. How, how many people are doing philosophy, right? Yeah. Now, and, and you know what's the irony? We keep talking about, oh, you know, yes, wisdom, philosophy, very important. But then every time, like, I, I know this because I, I grew up studying philosophy and people say, why do you study philosophy? Can get a job, man? Can eat, man? Right? So we, 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 we recognize the value of philosophy, of ethics, but we discourage our young people from pursuing it. Every time, I always have students say, I want to learn, but my parents say it's useless. You cannot get a job. So you notice there is this uh, contradiction, right? We say we value humanity, and yet we discourage our children because we say you cannot get a job. So I think we need to, to, to really you know, ask ourselves, do we, what do we really value? Yeah? Here we keep saying humanity. Then if we say that is the, the case, then we should encourage our young people to pursue ethics, philosophy. Yeah? Uh, yeah, so, so this, is, um, this is me coming from, from the position of a 30-plus-year-old, uh, th uh, working with, uh, I, I think I've taught about 7,000 students already. Yeah, yeah seven years, so 7,000 students, right? And, and this is what I've observed. And we are seeing all this as part of the digital transformation. And we cannot see them as separate things. They're all interconnected, one, one with the other. Okay, thank you.